Chapter 30, It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and you call to mind among the nations whether the Lord thy God has driven you. In other words, when you're driven out of the land and you're in captivity and then you remember what God has said. And you shall return to the Lord your God and shall obey His voice according to all that I command you this day. You and your children with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whether the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And if any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, from thence will he fetch thee. Now in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, uh, verse 31, we find this prophecy of Jesus declaring that its fulfillment will take place when he returns in his glory. When the Son of Man shall return in His glory, then shall the angels go throughout the four quarters of the heaven gathering together God's people back into the land. His elect. So that that elect of Matthew 24 does not refer to the church as some who say the church is going to go through the great tribulation do teach. But it is a direct fulfillment of this prophecy that relates to the nation Israel when the Lord returns as the Messiah. Then He's going to gather those who have been driven out to the various parts of the earth back into the land from the four quarters of the earth. And His elect will be drawn back into the land in a direct fulfillment of this prophecy Jesus relates to this in Matthew 24, 31. That is why those who emphasize their ministry in the New Testament often become confused as to Israel, its destiny, and as to the church. Because they take the scriptures that God has applied to Israel and they try to apply them to the church and they get all mixed up because they don't have the Old Testament background to see where this particular prophecy is a direct pro uh, uh, quotation almost of the prophecy. It's a direct reference to this prophecy in Deuteronomy, the book that Jesus quoted the most. And, and when you see it there, you realize the elect of Matthew 24 who are gathered together after the tribulation of those days cannot be the church, but is, is the fulfillment here in Deuteronomy. Now the Lord thy God will then circumcise your heart and the heart of your children to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul that you may live. And so at that time, God will just deal with a man's heart and take away the fleshly desires and so forth out of his heart. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over your father's. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep His commandments and statutes which are written in the book of the law. So over and over and over again, Moses is talking to them about the commandments, the importance of keeping the commandments in the same in verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say who will go up for us into heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that you may do it. So, God has given His word. And He has given His word in understandable terms. And not only that, He has put it in your heart and in your mouth. And any time a person says, well, I know I should not have done that, he is testifying to the fact that God has put His Word, His commandment in his heart. How do I know I shouldn't have done that? Well, I just know inside. God has... Put His law within my heart. The commandment is there. I know when I do right. I know when I do wrong. 
I know when I fail to do right. Oh, I know I should have done that. I knew all the time I should have done that. Of course you do. Because the commandment is there in your heart. And with your mouth, you're only testifying to the fact that the commandment is there in your heart. You know in your heart what is right, what is wrong. I know I ought to serve God. I know I ought to commit my life completely to God. I know I should commit this situation to the Lord. Then why don't you? If you know, and you do know. God hasn't hid Himself in some kind of mystic obscurity. So that you have to be some kind of a mystic and go into some kind of a trance and leave your body and project your spirit out into the heavens someplace where God might there speak to you in the hollow chamber with an echoing voice so that you'll know the Word and the will of God for your life. Neither is He across the sea someplace in a monastery in Tibet Or in some high place in India with a guru sitting in a little shed. Spreading his divine light. But the word of God is very close to you. Extremely close to you. The commandment of God is very close to you. It's actually in your heart. And God has there written his law so that you know within your heart when you've done the right thing you know when you've done the wrong thing and you confess it with your mouth so often I say I should not have done that I know it so often I say I should do this I know I should Therefore, I am not innocent. I am guilty. Because he who knows to do good and, do, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. My failure to do that which I know I should do is sin. I know it. It's in my heart. Now, Paul the Apostle takes this passage, quotes it in Romans 10. And there, as he quotes this passage, again he says, Say not that it is in heaven that someone should ascend to bring it down, or in the depths that someone should have to descend to bring it up, or beyond the sea that someone has to bring it back. But the Word of God is nigh unto thee. Yes, it is close to you. It is even in your heart and in your mouth. For, now Paul adds this, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now Paul goes ahead and takes this same passage and he shows how close every man is to salvation. Salvation is just as near as your heart and your mouth. Salvation is something that you cannot achieve or attain by climbing up to heaven. You can't go across the sea and kill the seven-headed dragon and steal the seven golden apples in order to be saved. It isn't salvation isn't some difficult experience that you can achieve only by tremendous effort and ability. But salvation is so close and so easy that no one is without excuse. For it's as close as your mouth and your heart. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus Christ 
is Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness, and with the heart man believes unto salvation. That's how close any one of you are tonight. You say, oh, I feel like I'm a, a, a million miles from God. I feel like God is so far away. No, God is very near to you. I feel like I'm so far from salvation. No, you're very close to salvation. But you don't know the life I've been living. I don't care about the life you've been living. I don't want to know it. I do know that any one of you can be saved in this very moment if you will just confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you would just now say, Oh Lord, take over my life. I surrender my life to you. Take it over now. That he would. Jesus, I believe that you rose from the dead. You'll be saved. That's just how close you are. You see, believing is a matter of choice. And you can choose to believe now or you can choose not to believe. You can choose to believe that Jesus did rise from the dead. Thus, attesting to the truth of what he declared that he was indeed the Son of God who came down to bear the sins of man in order that he might give to us eternal life who believe in him. And the resurrection capped the thing off. It made the hope for eternal life a living hope. More than just a hope. He gave substance to the hope by the resurrection. Or you can choose to believe that he didn't rise from the dead. That somehow the disciples gave some spiked drinks to the guards and after they passed out, they heaved ho on the stone and they stole the body of Jesus, took it off someplace else, buried it where nobody could find it, and then got together and made up a big story about finding the tomb empty and the linen clothes in which Jesus was wrapped all there in a the form but no body in it. And that they made a pact between themselves that they would stick to this story that no one would, would squeal or tell the plot even if they were put to death. And that all of them went to their deaths with this lie. With the exception of John who died of old age. But the rest of them all went to violent deaths for this lie that they told. Now, Satan has a philosophy of man. He had a philosophy of Job. When God said to Satan, Have you seen my servant Job? Perfect man, one who loves good, hates evil. Satan expressed his philosophy concerning Job. He says, Does Job serve you for nothing? Job's a mercenary, God. The way you've blessed that fellow, a man would be a fool not to serve you the way you've blessed him. Why, well, you've given that guy everything he wants. Anybody would serve you for that. Job is a hireling. Job is a mercenary. He's serving you, Lord, for profit. Let me take away his riches. Let me take away his goods. He'll turn around and curse you. Satan took away his goods. Everything he had. And he came back. And after Satan wiped him out completely, when the servant came with the last message, Job fell on his face before the Lord. And he said, Naked 
I came into the world naked. I'm going out. The Lord is given and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of these things, Job did not curse God, neither did he charge God foolishly. He didn't say, oh, God doesn't love me anymore. God doesn't care. He didn't charge God foolishly. So, Satan came back. Egg all over his face. His philosophy was proved wrong. God said, where you been? <laughs> Satan said, oh, I've been cruising around the world. Going up and down to and fro throughout it. Oh, wait a minute. Checked out my servant Job. Good man. God's doing a little bragging on him now. One who loves good, hates evil. Perfect man, upright. Now, Satan offers his second philosophy concerning men. It is this. Skin for skin. All that a man has will he give for his life. That's a pretty accurate evaluation of man. Life is the most precious possession that we have and all a man has he will give for his life. Because if I don't have my life then what good is it to have anything? So when it comes right down to it your life is your most valued possession. That was Satan's philosophy. It is an accurate evaluation of man. He's had a long time to study human nature. And our psychologists will tell us that self-preservation is the strongest natural instinct that you possess. So they agree with Satan's evaluation. I don't know, maybe they were inspired. <laughs> now, you see the problem that you're facing. If a man will give all that he has for his life, and all of these men gave their lives because they had agreed together to the lie that Jesus was risen from the dead, if indeed He did not rise, but it was all a big uh, hoax that they were perpetrating, you've got to somehow explain how that all of these men were willing to give their lives for a hoax. You've got to explain how they overcame man's strong, basic instinct of self-preservation. So you can choose to believe that the story of the resurrection is a hoax, or you can choose to believe that it was true. If you believe that it was a hoax, you've got some real problems with logic. If you believe that it is truth, then there is no problem. It all makes sense. And all of these guys bore witness of it. They said, we bear witness of this. So you're believing the mouth of witnesses. And if you're not willing to believe the mouth of witnesses, then we might as well throw out our whole jurisprudence system because our whole jurisprudence system is based upon the establishing of fact by the testimony of witnesses. And so you get the witnesses that are agreeing together. This is what happened. If we can't believe their witness, then we really should establish a whole new system of jurisprudence. So you choose to believe, you choose not to believe that he rose from the dead. It's a matter of choice, strictly. But by choosing to believe that he did when you can gain so much, why would you be so dumb to choose not to believe in spite of all of the evidence? You know, you're taking it, but it just shows man's stubborn heart and foolish heart. 
because he doesn't want to acknowledge God. A man is an agnostic not because God can't be known. God can be known. There are thousands that come to this church every week that will attest to you that God can be known. So a man is an agnostic not because God can't be known, but because the man has chosen not to know God. Because God is very close to every man. Salvation is very near. All you have to do is turn your life over to Jesus as Lord. And just believe that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Paul takes this passage and he, and he shows how that God has dealt with us through this passage in a new way. Because the commandment that Moses speaks about here in the 16th verse is that you love the Lord your God and that you walk with Him and that you obey all of His commandments and statutes and judgments. All right, I love God. And I want to walk with God. But my flesh is weak and I violated the commandments of God. So the addition that Paul makes by saying, if thou shalt confess by thy mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, that takes care of my failure. By that I am forgiven of my violation of the commandment. By that I am washed and cleansed from my sin. Thereby I have salvation. I have the life of God. That age-abiding life in Jesus Christ. So, Moses said, I call heaven and earth, verse 19, to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life because it is a matter of choice. You choose to serve God. You choose to believe God. You choose to follow God or you choose not to. It is a matter of choice and is encouraging you Choose life and the blessings of God rather than death and the curse of God upon your life. But it's your choice. You make that choice for yourself. God doesn't make that choice for you. You make that choice for yourself. God knows and has always known the choice you're going to make, but yet you're the one that makes the choice. And the foreknowledge of God does not take away from your responsibility to make the choice. Therefore, choose life. Choose the blessing. That you may love the Lord your God and obey His voice and cleave unto Him for He is thy life and the length of days. So Moses, chapter 31, went and spoke these words to all Israel. He said unto them, I am now 120 years old today. Happy birthday, dear Moses. 120 years old. Ah, oh, what a character. What a beautiful character this man is. One who walked with God in such an intimate way. He said, I can no more go out and come in. As the Lord has said unto me, you're to go over this Jordan. I can't go with you. I've gone as far. I've brought you as far as I can. It is interesting to me that Moses, who is representing the law, could only bring them to the promised land. He could not take them in. The law cannot take you into the full blessings of God. Grace must do that. So the law could only bring them to the border of the land. Now it's up to Joshua to take them in. And so, typical of our lives, the law 
cannot bring you into that glorious, rich life in the Spirit. It can only bring you to it. But by grace and faith, we must enter in. Now the Lord is going to go before you. He's going to drive out these nations, just like He's driven out Og and Sihon. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, He it is that goes before you. He'll not fail thee nor forsake thee. And Moses called Joshua, said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, He it is that will go before you, and He'll be with you, and He will not fail you, neither forsake you, fear not, neither be dismayed. Isn't that a glorious charge? Here's Joshua. Been depending upon Moses for a long time. He's been his servant. Now Moses said, Okay, Joshua, you're going to take over. Oh, that's an awesome thing. Fear would grip your heart. But Moses said, Be strong. Be of good courage. For the Lord is the one who is going to go before you. He will be with you. He'll not fail or forsake. So Moses wrote the law. And again, notice this, Moses wrote the law. For all of those theological scholars who want to, you know, argue about who wrote the five books, if they'll only read them, they'll find out that they tell them. Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of the Tabernacles, when Israel appears before the Lord, in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all of Israel in their hearing. So every seven years, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when they came to Jerusalem, they were to get out this law of Moses and read it for all the people. Now we've been several months going through this thing, reading it. And so that must have been quite a thing. Now we remember when Ezra returned from captivity and they gathered the people back into the land that they found the law, they opened it and they began to read it and the people stood from morning till evening as the law of God was read and they covered their heads and they began to weep as they realized how much they had failed God and as they realized from the law of God that their failure was the thing that had caused their being delivered into Babylon and all. And, and so they read the law in the time of Ezra and they gave the explanation. They did this for several days. The people would stand there from morning till evening as the law was read and explained to them as the people repented before God after the return of Babylonian captivity. Quite a, uh, a, a fascinating experience. And here there is that command. Every seventh year, the year of release, the law was to be read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Gather the people together, the men, the women, the children, the strangers that are within thy gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, that they may fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of the law. So these four things, they were to hear it, they were to learn it, they were to reverence God, and they were to observe to do the law. Verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, the days approach that you must die. Call Joshua, present yourself in the tabernacle of the congregation and I may give him a charge. And so Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud and the pillar stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers and this people will rise and go up. Uh, rise up and they will go whoring after the gods and the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Now God is telling Moses, flat. Moses, these people are going to go in and, and they're going to mess up. They're going to start whoring after the gods of the land. They're going to forsake me. They're going to start following these other gods. How discouraging it must be to have foreknowledge. 
Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles will befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because God is not among us? And I will hide my face in that day from all of the evils which they have wrought in that they have turned to other gods. Now therefore, write this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouth that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. In other words, now write this song for them. And the song is something they'll remember. And later on, when the calamities happen, this song, they'll still be singing the song, but as they sing it, then all of a sudden, they'll begin to understand it. The song will be a reminder to them of the reason why the calamities have befallen them is because they have forsaken God. So it, the song of Moses that he was to teach to the children of Israel uh, in order that when the calamities came, it would remind them and be a testimony or a witness against them. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, verse 21, that this song will testify against them as a witness for it will not be forgotten. So Moses wrote this song the same day, taught it to the children of Israel. And to Joshua he said, Be strong, be of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land, which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And so it came to pass when Moses made an end of writing the words, and again it tells us that Moses made an end of the writing of the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the Ark of the Covenant as, uh, as it was to be preserved there. And so Moses spake into the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So this is the song that Moses taught to the children of Israel. And incidentally, it was the first hit rock song. It is a song about the rock. <laughs> Try again. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all of his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So the song begins with the declaration of God as our rock of his works, his ways, his judgments, his truths, his righteousness. But the people, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and a crooked generation. Do ye thus requit the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he your father which brought you, which bought you? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, he'll show you. The elders, they'll tell you. When the Most High divided the nations, their in, to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds for the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Then in verse 11, a beautiful figure, as an eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, spreads abroad her wings, takes them, bears them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. And so the beautiful figure of, of God as an eagle. And as an eagle stirreth up the nest. Now actually the, the, the description here is of a mother eagle teaching the little eaglets how to fly. And how does the mother eagle teach the eaglets how to fly? By kicking them out of the nest. Now the little eaglets are very comfortable in the nest. And the nests were usually high up on the sides of the cliffs. 
But the mother eagle will kick the little eaglet out of the nest when the time has come to learn to fly. And the little eaglet will start flapping its wings uncoordinated and, all, and, and start falling as it's flapping and just falling on down. And the mother eaglet is fluttering over it. But then it swoops just about the time it gets to the rocks. It swoops underneath of the little eaglet and catches it on its wings and it bears it back up to the nest until the next lesson. <laughs> now that may seem like a pretty harsh way to teach an eaglet how to fly, but there's no other way to teach it. And it's got to learn how to fly. Now, the picture really is of God in developing us in our walk and relationship with Him. It's very easy for us to get comfortable sometimes in a particular position, in a particular place, under particular circumstances. And suddenly God begins to stir up the nest. We thought that we had great job security, but we find that we've been terminated. God, what are you doing? He's teaching you how to fly. And sometimes in your awkwardness, you, you look down and, and you're flapping around and you're screaming. And the little eaglets, they really scream as they're going down. And you see the rocks coming up so fast, you think, surely I'm going to be dashed. This is the end. It's all over. God, you've forsaken me. And then God just sort of swoops underneath, picks you up, and all of a sudden you begin to see the plan of God emerging. I was talking with a man the other day. We went to lunch together. He's the president of a large corporation here in Orange County. Three years ago, he was fired from Thrifty's Drugstore after working for them for 13 years. He was a manager of one of their stores. And he had received threats upon his life and upon his family. And so he asked Thrifty's to transfer him from that store. And they refused to do it. And he said... Well, either transfer me or fire me. So they fired him after 13 years. And he sort of thought, Oh, what's going to happen to me now? Lord, what's going on? And he was flapping and screaming. <laughs> but he went to work as a salesman for this corporation. And he was blessed. He soon became the sales manager in a few months' time. And when the owners decided to sell the corporation, he was then in a position to buy it and is now the owner and the president of this large corporation. Now you see, that's what God had in mind for him all the time. But as long as he had his job security and was working at Thrifty, he was not looking for a job. Now, God had this position for him, but how's, how is God ever going to get him to this position? The only way is to stir up the nest. To get him fired from his job at Thrifty's. Now I'm fired. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to look for a job. All right. Now you're in the position where God can lead you because you're out looking. You see, we get locked into situations. So often we get locked in, we get comfortable and, and we're not really looking for what God might have for us because we're very comfortable in this position. So God stirs up the nest. And we think, oh, I'm surely going to perish. No hope. And then God spreads forth His wings, bears you up. And thus we grow, thus we learn to trust in the Lord and rely upon the Lord as we are gaining strength and learning more and more how to fly. So that 
Beautiful picture of the eagle stirring up her nest, fluttering over her young, spreading abroad her wings, taking them and bearing them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. But they lightly esteem the rock of his salvation. When Jezreel, which is Israel, waxed fat, they kicked. They've waxed fat, they've grown thick, they're covered with fatness, so they forsook God and lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to devils, not to God. Now, Paul tells us that they who sacrifice to idols are actually sacrificing to devils. There was a common belief that a demon actually inhabited the idols of these gods. And that is very possibly true. I wouldn't doubt it at all. That many of these idols of little pagan gods actually have demons that are associated with them. So that they who were sacrificing to these idols were actually sacrificing unto devils, which shows the idiocy of saying concerning a person involved in a false religious system, well, he's so sincere in the worship of his God, surely God will, you know, accept him and save him. He's sincerely worshiping the devil, so God should reward him. Now of the rock that had begotten them, they were not mindful, they've forsaken God that formed them. And so this song, is quite a song of Moses, I'm amazed that the people were able to learn it. And so God tells them, because they have provoked his anger by the worship of these other gods. That he will heap mischiefs, mischiefs upon them. And they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I personally feel that this is a prophecy of the Holocaust in Germany. And the being burned in the ovens in Germany was predicted in this song. And when their troubles came, they were to sing this song. And if they would, it was to remind them of why the calamities befell them. Now, so often today, you talk to a Jew and you'll find he's an atheist because he'll say, where was God when my parents or my grandparents were burned in the ovens in Germany. If they would have kept this song and sung this song, they would know why all of the calamities befell them because they had forsaken God. And thus they had been forsaken by God. So God tells of the scattering of to the corners of the earth. Make the remembrance to cease. Oh, that they were wise, God said, that they understood this, that they would consider what is the end result. Oh, how God wants you to be wise and to look ahead and to see what the end result is of the lifestyle you've chosen. God's crying. He's crying over man's ignorance, over man's folly. Oh, that they did know only if they would look ahead and see what the end result of that lifestyle is. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them in? How could these happen unless God was with you? You, you, you forget to see, you forget to look that it was God's hand that did it for you. For the enemy's rock is not as our rock. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. The grapes are of gall, the clusters are bitter. 
Their wine is the poison of dragons and all. Now God said, to me belongs vengeance, verse 35, and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. That is the text that Jonathan Edwards used for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Unto me belongeth vengeance and recompense their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them make haste Jonathan Edwards in the sermon sinner in the hands of an angry God said that a sinner is like a man walking over a fiery pit on an icy plank Your footing is so unsure at any moment you can slip on into the abyss. It was a very powerful sermon, one of the most classic sermons in the history of the church, I guess. Jonathan Edwards was nearsighted. He had written out the sermon and he read it, holding it up close so that he could see it. And as he was reading this sermon to the congregation, the power of the Holy Spirit began to convict people so greatly that they began to crawl down the aisles screaming out to God for mercy. You want to read something that really chill you sometimes? Read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Oh, what a sermon. It's really heavy duty. This is the text for that sermon. And the Lord will judge His people and repent Himself for His servants when He sees their power is gone and there is none left. And He shall say, Where are your gods, the rock in whom you were trusting, which did eat the fat of your sacrifices and drank the wine of your drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now that I am He and there is no God with me or beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Some people say, does God make people sick? Well, He said here He does. For purposes. Different purposes within our lives. God declares that He wounds. That He even kills. That He heals. That He makes alive. There are certain teachers today who would deny this, but there it is. For I lift my hand to heaven and I say... I live forever, and if I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and reward them that hate me. For I will make my arrows drunk with their blood and so forth. And God goes on to tell of the calamities that will come, a song that they are to sing, so that when their calamities did come, they would remember this is the reason. So set your hearts to all of these words which I testify to you to this day. Verse 46 which ye shall command your children to observe the words of this law, for it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. Man, set your heart to it. Look, it's not an empty thing. It's your life. This is a matter of life and death. It isn't just something to pass off lightly. God is saying it's your life. Not a vain thing. Now the Lord said to Moses, get up into Mount Nebo, in the land of Moab, which is over against Jericho, and take a look at the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel for possession, and die in the mount where you go up. And so he gathered unto the people as Aaron, and, and you'll be gathered unto thy people, even as Aaron your brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people, because you trespassed against me at the waters of Meribah, 
And because you did not sanctify me in the midst of the children of Israel. So Moses, time has come. Get up in the mountain and die. Because you failed to properly represent me before the people at the waters of Meribah. Oh, what a heavy responsibility Moses had of being God's representative. His failure at the waters of Meribah cost him the privilege of leading them into the promised land. What a heavy responsibility each of us have for we are God's representative to that world out there. You're his witnesses. You're God's representatives. And God wants you to properly represent him. That's an awesome responsibility. God help us. Chapter 33. Now this is the blessing. Wherewith Moses the man of God blessed the children of Israel just before he died. He said the Lord came from Sinai rose up from Seir. And he shined forth from Mount Paran. And he came with ten thousand of his saints. Yea, he loved the people, all of his saints are in thy, land, in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet, and everyone shall receive thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. The king of Jezreel, or Israel, with the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. Let Reuben live and not die. And let his men be few. The word not, you notice, is in italics, means it was added. It was really, let his men be few. Now, uh, Reuben actually was one of the smaller tribes as they took the land. And it became really uh, sort of scattered among the other tribes. And the men of Reuben did become very few. This is the blessing of Judah. Judah. Hear, Jehovah, the voice of Judah, bring him into his people, let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou a help to him from his enemies. The prophecy for Levi, let the Thummim and the Urim be with the Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa, with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said to his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brothers, nor knew his own children, for they observed thy word and kept thy covenant. In other words, the priests of Levi were observed. Aaron was told, don't mourn for your sons when they die. Don't touch their bodies and so forth. And, and so he kept the word of the Lord, didn't regard his own family, but his service to God more important. Bless, Lord, his substance and accept the work of his hands. Concerning Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. If you'll take a look at the map of Benjamin, you'll find that uh, it sort of looks like shoulders, and right between the shoulders is the city of Jerusalem. If you'll look at Benjamin on a b map of the Bible uh, area of Benjamin, and so the Lord shall dwell between his shoulders. Here is the first hint that Jerusalem would be the place where the temple would be built, where they would come to worship the Lord. There in the shoulders of Benjamin, which was Jerusalem. Of Joseph, he said, Blessed be Joseph of the Lord, or his land, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, for the deep that coucheth beneath, for the precious fruits, and so forth. You remember Jacob said, Joseph is as a fruitful bough, bough whose branches hang over the wall. And so the fruitfulness of Ephraim and Manasseh the sons of Joseph. And of Zebulun, verse 18, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hid in the sand. Now, Zebulun occupied the area that is, the plains of Megiddo and the Mount of Carmel and out towards Haifa. Now, Asher actually occupied the, the port city of Haifa and north along the coast. But because of this prophecy, and also we'll get one about Asher here, who is, will dip his uh, toes in the oil, 
there are some Christian businessmen and men who are oil uh, engineers and geologists and all have gone over and studied the area around Mount Carmel because of these scriptures and they are convinced that there are vast oil reserves there under Mount Carmel and they are beginning drilling for oil. The first test well is starting the first of this next year. And they are hoping uh, to discover vast reservoirs of oil. They believe from their geological surveys, their seismology tests and so forth, that there are vast reserves of oil. If there indeed be, that makes this prophecy very easy, interesting concerning Zebulun, that he will actually suck out the treasures from the sand. And they believe that there are oil-bearing sands under this area that was once inhabited by Zebulun. And so they are beginning a series of test wells uh, the first of the year. In fact, we're supposed to visit one of the wells when we're over there in February. It's just about a, a mile from that monastery on the top of Mount Carmel. You that have been over to Israel, and if you remember the monastery up at the top of Mount Carmel, uh, just about a mile uh, beyond, or a mile east of that uh, monastery is where they're putting down the first test hole. And so it's very interesting. It'll be interesting to see what comes of it. But this prophecy concerning Zebulun is one of the things that sparked them to start their uh, geological surveys and testing over there. It is interesting that the vast oil resources of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East were discovered by Rockefeller after he read the Bible and reading of Babylon, how that they used tar for their mortar. He figured if there was that much tar in the area, there must be oil deposits there. And he is the one that went over on the basis of reading the Scripture and started the vast oil exploration of the Middle East. And of course, that's where they became so extremely wealthy is because he was reading the Bible and, and believed what the Bible said. And they started their drilling there in Iraq. And then, of course, they began to discover more and more the vast oil reserves of that area. But Rockefeller was prompted by the Scripture talking about the using tar for their mortar in Babylon uh, to go over there and to start drilling for oil. Now, if that indeed be the case, it would be interesting to drill down in the area of uh, the Dead Sea because they did use pitch down there also, or tar. Now of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlarges Gad, that dwells as a lion and tears the arm of the crown of his head. He provides the first part for himself and the portion for the lawgiver and so forth. And of Dan he said, Dan is a lion's well. He shall leap from Bashan. Of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfies the favor full of blessing of the Lord. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass and thy days, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now Asher, if you look at Asher on a map, Bible map, You'll see that Asher looks like a leg from the knee down with a foot. And the toe of the foot of Asher was at Haifa. He shall dip his foot in oil. Actually, the first major oil pipeline to bring oil out of the Middle East was built from Iraq to the port city of Haifa, once the pipeline was completed, it, they started shipping out a million gallons of oil a day through Haifa. Asher had his foot in the oil, just like Moses said he would almost 4,000 years ago. So it's a very interesting prophecy of the Bible concerning Asher, his foot in the oil, and that's exactly what did happen. Now, whether or not there is more than that, whether or not in their drilling they're going to find oil there, 
uh, it will be very interesting to find out. They are, as I said, starting their test wells uh, in the first of the year. Now this particular scripture, verse 25, the latter part, how I love this. And as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Take that as a promise of God for you. As your day, so shall your strength be. God's grace is sufficient for you. And whatever you are facing for that particular day, God will give you strength for that day. As your day is, so shall your strength be. I love it. The eternal God is thy refuge, verse 27, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone and the fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine. Also the heavens shall drop down their dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of Thy excellency and thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee and thou shalt tread upon their high places. The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers. Friday night we were up at um, Eureka. Beautiful, beautiful, clear night up there. Cold and clear. But looking up, we could see so many stars. And after the service, we were standing outside with some of the fellows and we were looking up and they were pointing at some stars and I said, well, that's the constellation Orion. I said, now you see those three stars that are in a row there? I said, the bottom star of those three stars is 450 million miles in diameter. If you would hollow out that star, leaving a crust a hundred million miles thick, you could put the sun in the center of that star and let the earth rotate around it and have room to spare. I said, now the amazing thing is that star is traveling at a speed estimated to be somewhere around 1,200 miles a second. Now that's an awfully large mass to be traveling that fast. How much thrust do you suppose it took to get Betelgeuse into orbit? The psalmist said, when I consider the heaven, the work of thy fingers, the work of thy hands, the sun, the stars, or the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The thrust that it took to get Betelgeuse into its orbit, that huge, huge mass, was just this. And I consider the heavens the work of your hands. Now, if God with his hands stretched out the heavens like a curtain, to me, the eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are not the everlasting hands, but the everlasting arms. Believe me, if with his hands he could stretch forth the heavens, his arms can hold you through any adversity or problem that you might be facing. Underneath are the everlasting arms. So often I wonder, God, are you able to hold me through this one? You sure, God, you can hold me up? I'm awfully happy at times, Lord. Underneath are the everlasting arms. How beautiful. Chapter 34, And Moses went 
from the plains of Moab to the mountain of Nebo, the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead, clear unto Dan. From Mount Pisgah there, he could see, clear on up to the area of Mount Hermon. Uh, Dan is right down near the base of Mount Hermon. So looking clear up to Dan, and on a clear day, you can get a beautiful view. And all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, Manasseh, all the land of Judah, to the utmost of the sea, clear on across the land. And the south, the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, even to Zor, which is the bottom part of the Dead Sea area. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying, I'll give it unto your seed, and I've caused thee to see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he, that is God, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, and no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died and his eyes were not dim nor his natural forces abated. So a 120 year old man, he died, God buried him. Now, we are told in the book of Jude that Satan and Michael had a dispute over the body of Moses. God buried him, but not before there was a dispute over his body. They never did find where God buried him. His sepulcher remains a mystery. But he went up into Pisgah and there in one of the valleys he died. God buried him after Michael and Satan had a big row over the thing. According to Jude. Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. But there arose not a prophet since in Israel that was like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all of the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all of his servants, and to all of his land, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all of Israel." Now, this last part was probably written by Joshua. Surely Moses didn't write the account of his own death. But Joshua, no doubt, took up and finished the book as he uh, spoke of, of the prophet Moses in all of the history of Israel, never an equal to this man. Until, of course, Jesus, who was more than a prophet, the Son of God. Shall we stand? Next week, Judges. And we are taking eight chapters. Joshua, Joshua thank you. <laughs> Joshua, eight chapters. So, Joshua is a very exciting book as they begin to conquer the land that God had given them. We'll take it in eight, eight, and eight going through Joshua. Father, we thank You now for the opportunity of studying Your Word again tonight and may Your Holy Spirit hide now Thy truth within our hearts that we would not sin against You. Lord, help us to learn that You have set before us life and death, blessing and curse, and it is ours to choose. And oh, may we choose that life that You have given to us in Jesus Christ, confessing Him now as Lord, Believing, Lord, that you rose him from the dead, we thank you that we have that life and that salvation tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting arms. Thank you, Lord, for the stirring of the nest when you're trying to teach us to grow. May we learn those lessons and may we grow into that full maturity in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name we pray.